Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear Business Consulting. Welcome. I'm Jay Shear with Jay Shear Business Consulting. We build solid foundations for service-based businesses to grow and scale and achieve the results and success they deserve. And you've joined Business Minds Coffee Chat. What does it take to improve one's quality of life, to develop influence and create opportunities for more earnings, greater reach, and real personal growth? Stay tuned because on this episode, we're talking with the man who has the answers. Our guest lives the adage that our past doesn't define our future. He's a husband and father, a decorated United States Army combat veteran, speaker, best-selling author, and consultant who helps individuals dramatically improve their quality of life through the consistent conscious application of honesty, integrity, and transparency. He's known for turning around multi-million dollar businesses and has an impressive list of well-known clients, including NASDAQ listed companies and London Stock Exchange companies. Please welcome the author of Unleash Your Humble Alpha and the man who once worked as a bodyguard for Mick Jagger, Olivia Newton-John, and Andre Bocelli, Stephen Kuhn. Stephen, it's great <laughs> to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. In my absolute pleasure. That, that, that was quite an introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm honored. And just spending some time researching you and consuming some of your content and looking at your book, you've, what a wow, what a wide ranging background and so many different experiences. And it's really been, it's been a great experience for me to do that research and learn more about you. So I'm really excited to jump into this conversation. So I thought a good starting point for us would be to to get more of a snapshot of your background. You came from a challenging background, and if you could touch on that, but most importantly, talk about what your backstory taught you, some of the lessons that you learned that allow you to show up the way you do today. Well, you know, it's an ongoing process as with anything, but I want to preface everything about what I'm about to say in this whole podcast is that nothing that I say is theory. Everything that I say is actually, I've done it. And then I've experienced it. So when we talk about um, quality of life and life enterprise and honesty, integrity, transparency, these are things that developed over the years through these challenges. So, you know, I, I came from, uh, you know, just like the typical American nightmare, they call it, you know, there's always something going on in somebody's life. And uh, I don't have to go into that. But with, uh, you know, 10 days after high school, I left for the army just to get out of there. You know, I, I like to say I was a patriot, but it was more about getting out of there than anything else. Uh, but I did thrive in the military because I found an identity that I could attach to that made me feel like a, a real guy, a real man, a real person, a real human being. Whereas before I saw myself as much less than that. So that was my first step into, let's say greatness, at least what I thought was greatness at, at, at that level. And as the years progressed in the military, once I went to Iraq, I went there and did what we were trained to do. And I decided, well, I don't want to do this anymore. And I uh, just saw too many things and did too many things that I'm not proud of. And uh, it wasn't, uh, wasn't something I wanted to continue to do. So I got out and stayed in Europe. And when I stayed in Europe, I, I, I stayed in Germany where I spoke limited language. Uh, I opened a cocktail bar and did some other like security and all kinds of stuff just to try to make money. And I, I did really well. I, I really did well, but it was a very small level. So, you know, I had at that time as a soldier gets out making, I think I made $2,500 a month. I was doing really well. Um, but then I got headhunted from a corporate, from a, a British PLC. And uh, I kept my bars and I ended up working for this PLC and worked my way up within, I guess, two years to director of European uh, operations and development, 3,500 employees, uh, 87 locations. It was ridiculous in a place where I was like, I wonder when they're going to realize that they got the wrong guy, right? <laughs> like I had no experience in the corporate world whatsoever. Luckily, I was still self-employed. So they brought me on as a self-employed director, which was fantastic for me. And uh, I worked my way through there and then I crashed and burned and um, we lost everything. The company split up. Um, they delisted from the stock market, fired all the directors. CEO was um, hostily removed. And uh, I ended up being on my own again. Um, at that time, my wife also left me. 
my past wife also left me and I lost all my money in a bad deal. So there I was within a week, lost everything. And, uh, I, uh, ended up writing a book in German and it became a bestseller within two weeks, <laughs> which was just dumb luck because it was about the first Iraq war. And it came out the day in 2003 when the second Gulf war started. Oh my. So it came out that very day and, and it wow. just sort of took off. Yeah. So I did TV and a book tour for a year and that gave me time to figure out what I wanted to do. And I remember I talked to a, um, what do they call him? A, someone who reads the stars, right? So, you know, you get panicked at those times when you lose everything. And I said, what's going on? You know, what, what am I doing? She said, you're going to see, you're going to have two choices, continue the path you're on or take a new path and it'll lead you in a completely different direction. And I chose the path that I was already on. I went back to the corporate world, you know, and we did the same thing, build it up and moved up and moved up. And then uh, same thing happened again. Uh, and this time I was homeless. <laughs> so it crashed even more. And that was in 2008. That wasn't that long ago. <laughs> And, um, so that, that, that led me to, um, a suicide attempt, uh, where I was saved by a, a trainee police officer who knocked on my door and came in, you know, stopped me from doing it. And I ended up having a friend to come get me and bring me to a monastery in the mountains of Austria, um, the Benedictine monastery, because the Benedictine monks chant, pray, and they meditate. So I spent a long time there and I came out of there a new man, knowing who I was, what I was all about. Loved myself, accepted myself fully and completely with all my issues and problems. And I came to find out that my whole life, the, to the degree that I accepted and loved myself, was the limit that someone else on the outside could love and accept me. So as soon as they tried to pass that line of what I accepted, we were pushing them away. I'm pushing them away. I'm arguing with them and trying to, I never realized that until it was in there. So this whole path, and I'm cutting this very short. You know, I, I was working for Mick Jagger in 1998 and then Olivia Newton-John in 2009. I was her, her business, one of her business guys. And Andrea Bocelli, I managed some of his business as well. I wasn't a bodyguard. Only, I was the only, only bodyguard for Mick Jagger. And, um, and all these things were like piling up. And people kept asking me, man, how do, you, how do you do this? Like, how do you just walk up to Bill Clinton and just start striking up a conversation and then he stands talking to you for half an hour? Like, how? And I was saying, well, I just do it. You know, I was like, I just do it. And um, people kept asking me, you know, you need to teach this stuff. So I came up with HIT about 10, 10 years ago, Honesty, Integrity, and Transparency. That was my first model, I guess you could say, acronym. Okay. And honesty with yourself and why you do what you do and say what you say. Then the transparency is part is how you step into the world with that honesty. And that's your ongoing reputation, right? And the byproduct of honesty and transparency is integrity. Integrity makes you authentic and authenticity allows you to dictate your market value, which is what I started to do. And, you know, I, it wasn't rare for me to get 20, 30 K a day to go somewhere to do consulting for one day. And I only did that because I said, wait a second, there's no one that does what I do and no one talks like I do. So let me just, actually, I found out by mistake. So I, I over LinkedIn, I got a message uh, and said, Hey, we'd like to fly you out to Turkey to mediate between two investment groups who want to buy this, like two companies and they want to turn it into a conglomerate. I went, you know, okay, whatever. And I said, I don't want to go to Turkey for a day. That's just a pain in the butt, flying out, flying back. So, Because I live in Europe, so it's, it's a five-hour flight. And I said, I'm going to give them a price that they'll never pay, <laughs> right? So I named this like ridiculous price. And they were like, okay, plus first, plus business class, plus hotel, plus food. I was like, wow, I guess I'm worth that. So these things where, where and, and what that taught me right there was my intention was, just to give them something and allow them to decide. I didn't care what the outcome was. And that's what, that's what ended up in the book, if you read it, creating um, that acronym that we use, well, that, that, that concept we use called creating space. So what I did is when I approached them, I had no wishes once preconceived notions or expectations. The only, my only intention was, like, I'm going to give you a price and you deal with it. Mm -hmm. And they did it. Why? Because I didn't push them. I didn't pull them. I didn't try to sell them. I didn't try to connive them. Nothing. I had no expectations. So that, that comes out with our rules that we have. One is either you have an expectation and you verbalize it, or you don't have an expectation. That'll save you 25% of every single day right there. Because you'll never be thinking, what are they thinking? What do they think they're going to do? Are they going to do this? I hope they do that. I hope it falls away. Because either you have it and you say it, or you don't have it, period. So all these things through my life, I started noticing. And then my my uh, my co-author co who is, was a buddy at the time we met in peru um, at one of my retreats now it's our retreats we do an annual retreat with plant medicine ayahuasca san pedro combo 
uh, to work with mostly veterans to help them work through the PTSD and find their, their identity, purpose, and certainty, right? So we worked through this whole process about a 10 days. And we met down there, and I had a group called The Humble Man, and he had a group called The Authentic Alpha. And we came together and named it The Humble Alpha. <laughs> I love it. Perfect yeah, marriage. Yeah. So, so I'm sorry I'm rambling on here, but this is such, such a great opportunity to get this out. Um, and so we sat down. And he said, dude, dude you're going to teach people how to do that. And I live like that too, but we've never really articulated it. And I got to tell you, it took a year to write this book because we did it in an interview process. <clears throat> because if you write your own book, you're biased, either pro or contra. So you're going you're gonna to glaze over something that you think is an important, but that exactly that thing right there, someone else might think like, oh my Lord, that's amazing. So we used independent people that didn't know us, that interviewed us, and they came up with like, how did you do that? What, what happened there? And it really made us dig in deep to the point where I can tell you, you know, we have the concept hit, then we have creating space, then we have life enterprise, then we have investing in relational capital and quality of life. I can tell you the exact moment in my life, the exact situation where every single one of those models were created and were born. Mm. But I didn't know it going through life. I only knew it since about a year now. I knew what I was doing. I did it in intuitively, but I couldn't describe it or explain it or detail it. And so now what this did, what this book did, and it's incredible, and I would, I would advise anyone to write a book that way, is it gave us a foundation from how to articulate what we do now. And the speed at which we are growing now, as far as communication goes, and as far as getting our message out there, is supersonic. I mean, this book came out in September. It's already been picked up by Forbes Business School MBA program as, a, as one of the, part of their curriculum. It's a, it's a college certification pro, program right now. And some other universities are picking up. U.S. Army is looking at it right now. And government contractors are looking at it. Amazing. It's September. Yeah, it's, inc it's incredible. It, it, it is incredible how quickly that has happened. And, and we're going to talk a bit more in detail about those different stages because I want to unpack some of that for our audience. But before we do that, you've you've shared a lot of information there, which I appreciate. Yeah. There are definitely some things that <laughs> I want to go back to. So let's first start with overcoming adversity because you mentioned two times, crash and burn. Those were the words that you used. Right. And I, I want everyone to be able to hear from you what the process is like for you in overcoming challenges, overcoming obstacles. So in your example, what did you process? What were you thinking about? How? So you, you mentioned about the, the, the monks. That was one scenario that you went through that was incredibly helpful for you and right. gave you a whole nother perspective on things. But the, the second situation, what, how do you work through and how do you process challenges? Well, let's, if we go back to the time, the first time where I lost everything in a week, um, the first thing I did was I was like, okay, I need help. And I was reaching out, looking for someone else to take care of me. Because that's often what we do when we're in trouble. We reach out to friends and family and people that are at our level and say like, hey, can you help me? I'm in trouble. What do I do? So everybody's, oh, it'll be all right. You know, they're always trying to take care of you, make you feel better, which does absolutely nothing for you. Right? It does absolutely nothing for you to, to help you actually move forward. And you end up doing the same thing you did before. That's why I stayed on that same path. The second time I went completely out of my comfort zone, somewhere I didn't know anybody or anything and just immersed myself in that. But I have to tell you this, before I went to the monastery and the suicide attempt, I was homeless for about three months, four months and after two, but before, and I could have gotten a job. I had plenty of offers, but I said, no, if I take a job now, I'm going to go down the same path. I'm going to end up here again. So what is it that I need to find out about me and why I keep making this mistake? There I was 40 years old, homeless, right? Working at that, I, I, I did get a job at night just twice a week as a doorman at a, at a nightclub, okay. which you got to remember at the time <clears throat> I had done German TV. I was a best-selling author. I had an MBA from a, from a prestigious U UK school. And there I was standing as a doorman at a club. So what happened? The TV came, the newspapers came like, what is this guy doing here? I flipped it and I said, why not? I'm doing the best. And I ended up being like the, the, the number one doorman in Berlin. It was hilarious. And like to this day, it's legendary because like, who's this guy? And suddenly I, I just went out and said, you know what? I'm going to treat everybody like they're like, I'm just going to like pour into everybody. I'm going to invest in them. And this club had a, a line going down across the street because people just love, I would sing Elvis out in front and I would just have, Hey, hey great to see you. Eh. You know, it, it was like so much fun. And I said to myself, why can't life always be like this? 
What if I go back to the corporate world? I would never be able to do this. You know, so that started, to, you know, sort of ticking the boxes for me. I don't want this. I don't want that because it's important to think about what you want, but it's also important to think about what you don't want because when you're plotting your path, right, to where your goals you want to go, some of those goals might lead to a direction you don't want to go because if, if, if you're doing one thing, it's going to lead to another thing automatically. So you want to make sure right. you want to root, root those things out. So I think the process was really letting go, letting go of what I thought I had to do, letting go of what society says I have to do. Look, you have an MBA, you're a best-selling author, you're on TV, you've got to do something corporate, you got to do something that's vivid, you got to do something that's out there. And, and I said, no, obviously I don't, or I would have been successful, right? But I never saw it as a failure. I never said, my God, you know, okay. When I was homeless, I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? But that lasted like a day or two. <laughs> and I, then I was sort of like, this is actually pretty cool. <laughs> no responsibility. Now I have to worry about anything. I can't pay my bills. So I'm not stressed anyway. You know, it was, it was quite amazing actually. And, and I, I relished in it after a while. No one knew I was homeless. I still had my nice suits and shirts and stuff. And I was in my car. Um, and I would stay at friends' houses and some ex-girlfriends that I knew that would still have me. And I would just sort of like bounce around and, and they were all cool with it. I'm like, ah, I'm traveling. Can I, you know, whatever. So I, I, I had a blast. So I think the, pro, the main process was letting go, number one. Number two, not allowing myself to have thoughts about what will be based on my past, right? I use my past as a structure and what not to do in the future if it didn't work out. And then I don't focus on it. So what, a lot of what, what I realized at that time and now even more is that I'd say 90% of the world or 90% of your day is filled with thoughts about the thoughts that you're having about what's happening. You're not actually thinking about what's happening. So you have a car accident. You're like, oh my God, I, I got to pay for this. My wife's going to be mad because I wrecked a car. I'm going to be late for work. And none of that happened yet. And yet there you are stressed out about it. So that really helped me too. So I started living in the now. I know that's an old burned out phase, but you know, I started living in the now and refusing to think about what might be in the future unless I was planning it, right? Unless I was planning it. Okay, visualization is super key for me. Like uh, moving forward, this is what it's gonna, this is what's gonna happen. And I visualize, visualize, visualize. And everything I have is due to that. So that's one of the processes that I use. That's the, the, the second process when I went to the monastery. I don't think that was a process that I chose. My buddy said, you're going you know, so, you know, it was sort of like you're going in there, but still, when you get out of that, you have to start over again because you're in this, in this world and suddenly you're fragile because you're all woo woo. I had no phone, no laptop, no access to the outside world. No one knew where I was except for my, my mother and father in America. And you know what shocked me the most? What's that? When I came back after about eight months, went back to Berlin, I saw some friends and I'm like, Hey man, how's it going? Hey man, Steve, what's up? Dude, I was like gone no, for eight no months. No time went by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was gone Amazing. for eight months. And they're like, really? I was like, yeah. And then I thought, yeah, friends, right? Where's the depth? What does it mean, right? What, what, what am I carrying with me? What's the legacy of my, of, of, that I'm leaving behind, you know? And, and, you know, I was well known and no one even noticed. And that, and that really hit me hard. And I said, well, I got to make a difference, man. I got to make a difference. So for me, the way to make a difference is a direct line of impact to people and create radiant value that just carries on out like a ripple effect. Yeah, that's, I, that's I, I love that. So, so tell us when you were in the monastery, what did you discover about yourself there? And how did that, so you were unplugged from everything. Yeah. Had, you, had you been meditating prior to this point? I was uh, uh, not at all. I had done a little bit of plant medicine, but I wasn't really, you know, into anything spiritual that much. I was reading and that kind of stuff, but I never could really meditate. Okay. I couldn't so really what did, meditate what did you, either. Okay. So what, so what did you discover about yourself at that time? And what were the tools, if you yeah. will, that were provided to you that allowed you to just radically shift and come out the other side much stronger? Well, it was structure was the first thing. They have their very structured. You get up, you have breakfast. First, first, you go to um, morning morning uh, chant prayers. So they at 5.45 a.m., they have a chant prayers where the monks go up front in this little chapel built in like year 400 or something, like ridiculously old. Wow. And it's dome-shaped, and they stand at the front, and they home, you know, sometimes in French, sometimes in Latin, sometimes in German, sometimes in English. And it vibrates through the entire chapel, and it goes through your body. You really feel that vibration. It's like a reset, right? 
my hands are vibrating when I talk about it. So it's like a, it's like, it's like a complete di- you know, DNA reset somehow. Then you go to breakfast, then you have time to go to the, to the, uh, they had this garden with like eight different meditation spots with flowers and trees and absolutely beautiful. And you meditated and then you go to lunch and then you go out and then you go to, and then you go to dinner. It was like super structured. So that gave me something that I could follow first of all. And it gave me things to do. So I had to chant. I had to, you know, there was afternoon session as well. And, you know, it was all Christian. They're all sitting there like this. I'm sitting like this, <laughs> like, you know, with my hands out, sort of absorbing all the energy. Everyone else is praying. And they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just absorbing this, you know. And so I was always the odd man out my whole life. So I'm used to it. But um, I think the process uh, there was actually having some something to build build upon. So I had processes and procedures that they gave me to do. It wasn't like you can or you can't, you will do this. And I did it. And that's sort of building upon that. And what that gave me was a sort of an ease of what are we going to do out here for, you know, all this time? What, what, I can't just sit here by myself kind of thing. Right. And it really made a difference. Um, I think getting up that early in the morning was reminding me of the army where I was a pretty good version of myself at that time. So that gave me a little push, you know, and then again, I let go of any expectations I had about anything, about anything at all, especially what was going to happen when I get out. A matter of fact, when I was in, I was, I, it never once dawned on me that I was leaving. That's how far atta- detached I was from, the, from any kind of outcome. Yeah. Interesting. And I just said best version of myself in every situation. And I, you know, I, I wish I could write it down for you what I did you know, exactly. But in, in the end, you let go of all this garbage, all the pre-programming, all of the preconceived notions that you have, all the things that your parents told you you have to do, all the things that society tells you you have to do, what school told you you have to do, all of these programs that are in your brain. I just let go of all of them. Just let them go and purge them. Amazing. Well, I mean, truly amazing. And there's so there's so many valuable lessons learned in what you are talking about right now. Because we talk a lot about mindset. We talk about letting go. We talk about removing limiting beliefs and biases and just baggage, right? Things that we bring along with us that we think define who we are. They may shape who we are to this point, but we, right. we can change, right? We can change based on the way that we, the way that we think and who we surround ourselves by and the types of content that we consume and what we read. So what, what, a, what an amazing story. What is, and, and we're going to go back to the book here in just a moment. What is something that you believed about yourself that you found out wasn't true? And there may be many things, but what is, that's a whole podcast. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But if you, if you were to pick one thing in particular, Um, I think at that time I thought I was a strong man, but I was only strong physically, but not emotionally, not at all. Like zero, zero emotions, emotional strength. I was so Mm. fragile. It was incredible. Um, But you know, I'm a big guy. I'm six, four at the time I was two eighty. you know, really big guy. I'm two, two thirty now, I guess, or two forty. And I, you know, your strong body, strong mind, strong spirit, strong, you know, and everyone thought of me like that. And, uh, when I wrote my book, um, a lot of people are like, you're, that's, that's not your, that's not a true story. Is it like, that's not you. You're not that you're not what? Like they couldn't believe it. My ex-employees and things, they couldn't believe it. And what that showed me even more than realizing myself was that, man, I was being two different people. You know, I was literally not being who I was. I wasn't mm. being a version of myself at all. You know, and, and it was like, wow, I cheated these people out of, out of, you know, contributing to their life. You know, it, it was just, I cheated myself too, out of being who I am. And that taught me like, you know what? You got to be unabatingly you. Of course, your principles for me, my principles were honesty, integrity, transparency, investing in others, leaving them in a better place. And when you meet them, I don't care if it's a bag lady down the street, the cashier, my wife, my kids. My mission is to leave everybody in a better mental state. Then when I meet them, whether it's a minute or an hour or a year or 20 years, whatever it is. And when you start realizing these things and doing these consciously, you change, right? You change. And that's the funny thing about it is when you start doing this with others, you're changing yourself. Instead of like most people say self-development, go honker down in a corner, read a book and change yourself. It's the practice. It's the applied knowledge that makes a difference. It's not the reading, right? And that's why when we wrote the book, because what always bugged me about these how-to books was they'll, you know, you read them and like, am I amazing? And you're looking like, where are the freaking steps? Like, what do I do now? Right? Like, what do I do now? So we literally have every chapter is a story, a lesson, and the exact steps that you have to take 
what you have to do, not how you have to do it, but what you have to do to extract your own greatness, to extract your own lessons. And that's why the book has become so powerful because it's everyone's own version. Basically, you're writing your own book when, when you read our book. Love it. So why don't we do this? I think this is a great point then to really talk about those and, and walk briefly through the five different stages. So can you take us through those and just kind of give us a, a synopsis, yeah. if you will? So we start with Activate. Right. Okay. So we want to go through those. Okay. So we, we, we start with activate and that's activate your true identity, knowing who you are and how you interact in the world. So that's, we uncover your identity. It's a two or three word moniker and what you're going to come up with, which always changes as you go through life, right? It's always changing. It's always adapting because, you know, I was a soldier. I was, I was obviously a part of my identity and now I'm not, but it's still a part, but not a major part. So it's always sort of transforming itself. And then how you interact in the world dictates who you are as far as identity goes. Are you being true to who you are? And are you, are you acting in the world that way? Like I said before, I was a very sensitive guy, but I was acting like a tough guy. So it wasn't aligning. So we uncover that for you and help you really uncover who you truly are. And that's because the next stage, Unleash, is unleash your purpose in life. Know what you do in the world that makes you feel alive. And that's aligned with your identity. As a matter of fact, once you know who you are, your purpose almost sort of crystallizes right in front of you. It's actually, it's, it's actually quite, a, quite an, an, an incredible thing because you're like, wow, I never knew that about myself, you know? And this book takes you through, okay, think about this, say that. What do, what do people say about you? How do you feel about this? And it's like all these questions you're going to answer to get to this point. So it's activate, unleash, then it's empower. And that's creating space and elevate all those within your life enterprise so that everyone steps into their own greatness. So first it was you, identity mm -hmm. and purpose. And now it's about you elevating others to help them step into their own greatness. Because that, again, that direct line of impact, that radiant value, right? That's what you're going to have as an effect because that's the practice side of it, right? That's the tangibility of it. You do it with yourself first and now you're going to be tangible with it so you can embed it into who you are. So you got to show it to others, right? So that's, a, that's applied knowledge. You have to do that in order to embed it into your, into your belt. It's like getting a college degree and, and, and never doing the work. I don't care what you got a degree and you don't know how to do it, right? <clears throat> and then it's momentum. Momentum, momentum, I love this, is amplifying your purpose by igniting the fire within others through partnerships and investing in relational capital. So partnerships, collaborations, helping others, you know, pushing them into, into a direction if they need it or helping them up, you know, the, the ladder, wherever they're going, and actually being taking an, an integral role in their life, in their life enterprise, we like to call it. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. Okay. And so it's, it's not just empowering them, but it's actually then once you invest in them, relational capital. It's like investing in, in, in normal capital, but it's a guaranteed return, right? A law of reciprocity. So you're actually helping them. Hey, what do you need? And so what we like to say is be the problem solver. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, well, I can't solve all the problems. Well, neither can I, but you know what? I know enough people who can, right? So it, it's not about you having all the answers. It's about you knowing someone who has answers to help the person in front of you. And that's where creating space comes from. Because when you show up wholly and fully for the person in front of you with no preconceived notions, cookie cutter solutions, or no expectations with one thing only. And that's an intention to create value by solving problems because we only control the intention. We don't control the outcome anyway. So why worry about it? Because if you worry about the, the, the outcome, what am I doing? I'm trying to push you into a direction that I want you to go. And who knows if you want to go that way? So we talk first and we listen first and we create that space. And what that does is you're like, wow, this is like really easy to talk to Steven or it's really easy to talk to Lane, my co-author. And we sort of lean in and we create that boom, that mastermind. And then suddenly you're coming up with ideas and solutions that you had never would have thought of on your own. I mean, Lane and I get together with other people and we create space and it's just, it, we sit there and go, man, it works every time. It's, it's magic. I swear it's magic. We come up with, it's crazy. Anyway, so that's momentum. And then of course, activate, unleash, empower, momentum leads to one thing. And that's what everybody on this world seeks. And that's quality of life. And quality of life is fully enjoying every moment of your life, no matter what the activity, work or play. So they're, they're the five steps, activate, unleash, empower, momentum, and quality of life. And they're, 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 they're laid out in a way where it's cascading. So you can't step ahead. You can't skip ahead. You can't just read the book. You got to do the work or the next yeah. stage won't, won't make any sense to you. Follow the flow. How, exactly. do, you, how do you pronounce the, the German word for quality of life? Lebensqualität. Okay. Lebensqualität. 
Life is Leben, Qualität is quality. Yeah, Leben's Qualität. It's like Farfik okay, Newton. Perfect. Remember that? Farfik Newton? Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking at it in the book and I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this. So it's a typo, you. unfortunately. There's a typo, unfortunately. There's an E on the end, unfortunately, but there's absolutely no E. So it's Leben's Qualität. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Terrific. So... <laughs> The, the book has been doing incredibly well. You're changing lives with this book. What kind of feedback are you getting? Sh share with us some of the success stories and what you're hearing from those that have read it and more importantly, are actually applying it. Yes. Well, that's the only way that you're going to find out that it works is if you apply it. You know, um, I think, I think, you know, there's a lot of people changing out there. There's a lot of people saying, I never realized it about myself. My life is completely different. My I'm empowered. I'm starting a new business. All these things are, are great, but the most important that, that I mean, the most impactful things for me is when I get a, a letter from someone's from a, from a buddy of mine who said, Hey, I just bought your book for my two daughters. You know, they're starting out as entrepreneurs and they read it and they're on fire, brother. I don't know what you did. This is like heaven. You were downloaded from somewhere in the universe or something. They're the stories that I like, or I'm reading it to my, my eight year old son and he's taking it on. He's using the verbiage because in, in, in any movement, and this is a movement, let's face it. That's what we're, that's what we're doing here. When you can, when your readers and your people in your movement use your verbiage in their everyday life, then you know you're having an impact. When they, when they, when they say QOL, you know, which is the hashtag for quality of life, um, and, and I've done 608 videos, right? One a day for 608 days, except for weekends. Wow. And I do it every night. Yeah, I do it every night. Um, it's about 10 minutes. And at the end, I, I always say, and it's all about quality of life. You know, and it's just become this thing and everyone's like quality of life every time they see me. And we talk about relational capital and life enterprise and creating space. And you hear people in our community start using words like creating space and life enterprise and investing in relational capital. And we know it's hitting home. So for me, that's the most impactful where, where we see our verbiage being used in an in, in, in application style with other people that we don't even know. That's radiant value right there. Beautiful. Yeah, love, crazy. love that. Love that. So, so let's talk about the the power of relationships and how meaningful that has been throughout your life, your professional career. So, share with us why relationships are so important: building rapport, networking, and being around the right people. Well, the first thing I would say is that most people look at networking like a structured activity. Okay, I'm gonna. I had a guy ask me one time, "Hey, we're going to this event." I have a thousand business cards. You think, you think that's enough? I was like, well, it's a three day event, eight, eight hours a day. If you talk to a person every minute, you're still not going to give away your cards. So what do you think? You know? So, you know I mean? It's like, <laughs> and so it, it isn't really a structured event. I, I sort of go with the flow, but I can tell you what, what, what works really well is that you don't talk about yourself. Talk about them, let them talk, ask questions. If they ask a question about you, you simply say, yeah, I do this and that and send it back. Of course, you got to have your PPR, your problem product resolution, your 10 second sort of what I do kind of thing. Donald Miller has an explanation really well. Problem, product, resolution. You ask the problem, oh, you know how leaders always always have two personalities, one at home and one at, well, we have a program that fixes that. And in the end, they come out as a better man, husband and leader. So that's sort of my PPR. And then I go, what does it say, say that you do or where do you work or whatever? So I get it back to them because- People love talking about themselves, especially in, 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 in networking. But that's, that, that, should, that should be in a grocery store. That could be anywhere, right? It's not an, especially an event. It could be anywhere, number one. Number two is always be solving problems. Always, and I mean always, and I don't care if it's your wife, your husband, a lady down the street, someone random at the grocery store. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter who it is. Always be that person. And you'll be surprised how people flock to you. Hey, hey, I got this problem. Hey, I got this problem. And at first I'm thinking like, why is everybody coming to me? And I'm like, well, because I sort of solve everybody's problems. Okay, good. And you start reaching out to other people and you bring that, hey, I got someone for you. Like right now, I, I give the, the woman who took our book and made it into a college course, I swear, I give her a referral every single day. Because people are like, hey, man, what? It's a course? I'm like, yeah, do you have a course? She's like, they're like, yeah, okay, let me give you the address. You can go talk to her. And maybe you'll have a course too, you know, a college course. And oh, what, really? And it's just like I was on club, I was on Clubhouse today and I just mentioned it. I had like 17 emails, you know, of people say, hey, can you introduce me? I'm like, of course. And, and I love doing that. Why? Because I just made two people happy, right? And it took me 30 seconds to write an email. You know what I mean? And yeah. for me, that's an investment in relational capital. I'm, it's a guaranteed return, man. It may not be from them. It may not be immediately, but it's going to happen.
It will happen. And that's with 100% certainty. But you can't expect it. Remember about the expectations, right? You can't expect it. <laughs> Law of reciprocity. So it's that, it's, it's yeah, a, a balancing of, act. Yeah, it is. It, you, you, since you brought up Clubhouse, let's chat about that for just a moment. That's actually where you and I engaged with one another. I heard you answering a question in a room. So uh, Clubhouse is relatively new, but it, obviously it's gaining speed at a massive rate. What do you see as the real value of Clubhouse in a social platform of that nature? Uh, direct access to the people that you never have direct access to before. You get a chance to listen to them without sitting down and listening to a whole video content. Like if I want to hear Grant Cardone, I can go in a room and listen to him for 10 minutes. If I like him, I do. I don't. I don't have to buy his program or watch 25 videos. You know, it's like I meet him live. It's not curated content, right? This is what they say is what they say. Um, unfortunately, now it's getting to the point where uh, most of the rooms are just moderators talking with each other. <laughs> so the audience is getting less and less involved. Um, but, you know, for, for me, I'm in there. I'm not very fluffy. I'm not one of the, hey, thank you for having me. I don't do that. I'm just like, hey, Stephen, this is my answer. Go for it, you know, kind of thing. And I've gotten sort of that reputation as well. So people are like, Stephen, you, don't, you just say it and it's good. And that's really getting, that's getting a lot of people coming to me, not for business, but for all kinds of things like craziness like PR and Hey, you want to be on my show? Or you, I got, I got asked to be on a reality TV show. I got asked to be in a, on a new TV series and an, another documentary, you know, I mean, I'm not doing it, but I, cause it's not my path, but it, just through clubhouse, just through my voice, right. Through my intention and my voice, my intention is to add value and solve problems. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in there to add fluff. I'm not in, in there to make everybody feel, you know, warm and fuzzy. You have a problem. I'll solve it. Matter of fact, if you look at my profile, it's like, you have a business problem. I'll solve it. I just left a yo out, you know, from, from ice, you know, vanilla ice, <laughs> but seriously, you have a problem. I'll solve it. And that's it. So you ask a question in clubhouse. If I can answer it, I answer it. I'm done. And most people don't know how to deal with that. Cause when I'm done, they're just like, that's great, Steve. Thanks. Because I'm not saying, Oh, and I hope that helps you because you know, the world is so great. You know, I don't, I don't I'm not, I'm not busting on people who do that. I'm yeah. just saying, there's, I don't do that. There's enough of that. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's exactly. plenty of that out there. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, and I love that uh, about the way that you respond, the way that you engage. It's very direct. And to your point, it is it is about adding value, but I'm going to add the value. I'm going to pour that into you. And then I'm going to, then I'm going to finish. Yeah. Then I'm going to leave, or I'm going to help create a solution somewhere else or right. put two people together. Right. To which try I to did, figure I out did ways today, to, which okay. I did today. Hey, so-and-so meet so-and-so you guys got to do them like that. And, and, and it's, and it's also the point that, you know, I, I, that's it. You, you, you add value and you move out. You know, I, I don't say, and this is Steven and I'm done speaking. Like, I don't do any of that. I don't even say my name most of the time. Like, Hey, I have something to add. And they always say that was Steven at the top, you know, cause I don't even, I don't even say like, follow me, you know, none of that stuff. Right. I just right. enjoy giving direct. I love it because I, I, I only stay in my wheelhouse of what I've done and what I have tangible results, long years of results. That's what I talk about. Cause anyone, now, if you hear me talking on Clubhouse, Google me and see if I've ever done anything that I'm talking about. And I promise you, you're going to find some track records. Yeah, I was just going to say another important point. You, you mentioned it, staying in your lane, right? Doing what you know, doing what you have experience in based on results and yeah. not going in 18 different directions in areas that you really don't have no. any experiential knowledge in. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's incredible. You have 19 year old kids up there, you know, talking about business and running businesses and investing money and stuff. And it's just like, I'm not taking his advice. Maybe, you know, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to bust them out, you know, to each their own. But it's just, it's just, well, there's a big fraud thing going there now as well. There's like, there's people starting other rooms on Twitter and they're calling people out and they're, they're like forming an attack. You know, like oh. I heard this about, you know, about some stage mongers or whatever you want to call them. Um, and I was like, Jesus, this is ridiculous. You know, it's like, it's a whole world I don't even want to get involved in because it's just distraction, man. It's just distraction yeah. from that's a, that's a, my life, my life. Exactly, right? There you go. That's you exactly right. You can only have impact in the world when you're squared away in your life. How about that? Another yeah. great point. So you are known for turning companies around, for turning businesses around. So share with us, if you will, when you first work with a business, when you're engaged to work with a business, what is, what are the, what are the steps that you go through when you are not only onboarding a new client, but what are you focused on when you start working with that business to look at how am I going to turn this business around? First thing I ever do, I got five questions, right? So where are you at right now? What's your status report? We call it a sit rep situation report. 
Okay. What are the challenges you're having? Like what, what are the issues you're having, the tr- challenges and troubles you're having? What have you done to try to overcome those challenges? Right. Then why do you think that didn't work? In other words, why'd you call me? Right. And then where is it that you want to go? And what I'm going to find out is typically they don't really have a really situation report. They're just complaining. Right. What their issues are, it's usually something outside of themselves, which is obviously not always the case, right? What they've done to try to fix that was typically hiring somebody else to come fix their own problems, right? And then why they think it didn't work is because the people didn't do the work right. And then, of course, where do they want to go? I want to to get rid of this stuff. I want to get my company successful and make so and so much money. So the four things that they say, when they say it, it's true. When I say it, it's me accusing them. That's why it's important for them to say the issues that they have, the problems that they have. And so what, what, they're, what they're usually announcing is their perceived problems and their perceived challenges. Because you, as, as anyone else would know, who's in any kind of consulting or coaching or training, that any issue in a company, uh, when there's issues in the company, it, it's always the leader's responsibility. So if I say my sales team's crap, you might say to me, Stephen, my sales team's crap, you need to fix it. I know right away, something's missing. You didn't do an SOP, you don't train them, you don't have ongoing education, something's up right? And so I'll be like, okay, I'll take care of it. So I'll go down there with the sales team and I'll work with them one-on-one to get them ramped up, get them motivated, inspired a little bit. And you're going to be like, oh, awesome, Steve. Mm -hmm. And now I've gained your trust, but now we get to work on you, right? So gain, you gain their trust on their perceived problems first through those five questions. And once you get those issues um, alleviated or at least structured, so they're going to be alleviated, then they have trust in you. And then you can approach them with the real issues about the basis sort of of the entire company. And that's the culture because culture follows action. Real simple. What you do is what people are going to do. So if you're, if you're not living your culture, neither will they, and Mm -hmm. nor do you ever dare expect them to, you know? So, so that, that's the whole, it's like, it's a whole mixing process in there. Now, when I used to go in person, I did the same thing beforehand. And then when I went in, I'm like, okay, I'm coming in. Are you ready for this? Cause I'm myself, I'm going to work in there every single day with your team for three to six months. You ready? I'm like, yeah, I have carte blanche. I'm like, yeah, okay. All right, here we go. So I would show up. I remember one time I showed up in Switzerland and I had everybody get out of the office. There was two office spaces and I switched the offices, even the desks. So like, no one sat on their old desk, old desk or in the old place they were before. So the leaders sat in the room where the employees sat and the employees sat in the room where the leaders sat and they sat face to face with different people they didn't, they weren't sitting with before. And then at night I had them paint the office, right. And clean out all the shelves and anything that was left out that wasn't in a proper place. I threw it away. Awesome. Like, I didn't care what it was. A big stapler. It was a, I didn't, I copy machine. I pushed it down the stairs. I mean, it was like, I'm, it's, it's done. Right. And then the people were digging stuff out of the trash. And so what, what that does is it's a, it's a disruption, a major disruption where they're like, okay, something's happening. Because if you come in there as a, as a manager or a leader or a turnaround specialist, and you're like, okay, we're going to turn things around. We're going to do everything different now. And people are still sitting in their same place, looking at the same walls, talking to the same buddy beside and bitching about whatever they're bitching about. They're not going to change anything. You're going to have a heck of a time. So this is what we're doing. We're switching it up, you know? But the more that you do that, that so, so you have that, that disruption and then you have one-on-ones with everybody, then you create the vision through the individual visions. Now that's the hard part. So you got to talk to everybody else, find out what their mission and their vision is in life in general and what their mission is in this, in, in, in this company. And you'll often find the people in the wrong jobs. You have the right people on the right bus, but in the wrong seats, <laughs> right? So you put them in the right positions and you'd be surprised that a lot, most of the companies that I've turned around, I never had to fire anybody. So all of the losers that they wanted to get rid of, they ended up being superstars. They were just in the wrong place. Right? Makes sense. Yeah. And, and then you look at the six essential human needs. So, you, you know, things like <clears throat> connection or um, certainty, uncertainty, vi- ver- uh, variety, um, you know, significance. So if someone's acting up in your team, right, they're seeking significance, obviously. Give them significance. Make them stand on a desk and tell them to sing a song. They'll be happy. You know, it's like, just give them, give them what they need to be the full person of themselves. Everyone has a different need, but guess what? There's only six essential human needs. And when you figure those out, whenever you look at your employees and the people you're working with, you can tell like that what they need and you just give it to them. Mm. You know? So, so it's, it's like a, pro- you just walk in there, you feel the people, you feel the vibe, you switch it up, you come around, you talk to every single person about what they want, what their vision is, a real vision, and you align the company vision and theirs in one direction. That's where culture comes from. We're all headed in, this, in the right direction. I know as an employee that every t-, t I cross and every dot I dot, it's headed in that, in that direction where I'm contributing like directly 
to the vision and the mission of the company. And it's not, it's the culture, it's the people, it's the culture and it's the people. It's not the freaking walls and this and the other, but you have to change that to get their attention. Love that. Is there a client that you would not work with? (sighs) Plenty. I typically don't work with big corporations. It's just, I always, I always say they're like tanker ships. You need to change something that's going to take about 30, 30 kilometers for them to even make a small turn. Right. I'm, I'm looking at speed boats and maybe yachts. Right. Okay. So <laughs> they can turn on a dime kind of thing. Yeah. You, they they, they, they got to be agile. They got to be agile. Okay. Plus, the dis- decision making process is just, you know, you talk to the director, the director has to talk to the CFO, the CEO, the CEO has to talk to the CEO, the CEO has to talk to the board, the board has to go to, you know, it's just, it's just too much. Yeah. You want things to move quickly. Okay. Right. Yeah. And plus, I don't like sticking around. That's why I'm a turnaround guy. <laughs> Three to so, six months. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Next. Gotcha. Okay. Wonderful. So what do you, what do you want your legacy to be? All, all the different things that you've been involved in, all that you are in the process of building, what, where does this all lead to? You know, if you'd asked me that question two weeks ago, I'd ask it, I'd probably answer it differently, but right now I just, um, I, because I invest in relational capital and solve problems all the time, I just had a dream come true and I got, um, um, an investment fund for veteran owned businesses. I f- founding a veteran and I have investors of nine figures already, uh, already pledged yeah. for nine figures. So my, my legacy besides obviously my children, five and six year old daughter and son and my wife um, to leave them in a place where they're, they're never uh, going to have to uh, struggle again. And for the next three or four generations, that's my, that's my sort of my legacy, but I don't mean giving them everything and shoving them up their butt. I'm saying that they'll be comfortable that they'll never have to go through a lot of things that a lot of people go through, um, whether that's good or not remains to be seen, but that's one of the things that I'm leaving behind. But this new, Beautiful. this new legacy is, legacy is actually change the paradigm of how people think about veterans with, you know, a couple hundred million dollars. I can do a lot for veteran owned businesses. I can do a lot for veteran ad- advocacy. I can do a lot for education in, in, in the general public about veterans and, you know, because when, when I say veteran, what do you think? PTSD, angry, wheelchair, Vietnam jacket, long hair, beard. You know, that's sort of what people think. They have this. And I, I know that because I've asked like hundreds of people. And I want to change that paradigm, you know, that we're a, a massive. Um, um, we can be a massive asset to society. Uh, veterans can be. And they are, you know, and uh, but more can be that way. And so a lot of these guys just need a little bit of help. And gals just need a little bit of help. There's a lot of things that people don't know about the military, like, People know about PTSD, combat PTSD. I got it. But how, how, how many people know about um, uh, sexual assault in, in the military? It's rampant. It was rampant. Mm. Rampant, men and women. Yeah. I never saw it, but it's rampant. I mean, I've, and we, we have the largest veteran entrepreneur social media group on social media. It's, in, it's on Facebook called Vetpreneur Tribe. And the stories I've heard in there, the people I've talked to in there, I just, I, just, I can't imagine. Uh, so many women, so many women were abused in the military. It was incredible. I never, never knew. Mm. So these things, these things to come out, these things to realize, well, okay, we're all normal, normal people, but we can contribute and we want to contribute. Why? Because we talk about this in our book, your identity, when you lose it, how do you lose your identity? Well, when you're a military in the military, you have a purpose greater than yourself to serve your country, to serve your fellow man, right? And to write that blank check to die if you have to, to give your life. What compares with that for the rest of your life, right? Yeah, so you get, you get out, of, out of the military and you're just searching and searching and searching and searching for some kind of fulfillment. And that's what triggered us to really dig in into the identity part of it. Because for us, for me, for Lane, that was a big part of what we were missing. Just that, that greater purpose, man, like something that's so much bigger than ourselves. Yeah. And so we, that's one of the reasons we wrote the book is like, when you find that, you're unstoppable, man. I mean, you're, mm. you're just, that's, that's why we say own your presence. Because when you grab it, you walk into a room, you don't have to say a word. Everybody's like, poof, who's that? And wow. you don't even have to want to do that. That's what happens when you own your presence. Oh, it's crazy. Oh, Stephen, you're giving me chills, but I'm, <laughs> I'm envisioning this right now. I'm just the power of your words and the energy behind it. That's uh, it, it, truly in, incredible. So... Before I ask my final question to you, I would love to continue to talk on and on with you because there's so many questions yeah. that I have for you. 
uh, but for the sake of, of time, what message would you like to leave our audience with? These are so many, I, you know, I, I would, I would say, honestly, grab the book, you know, I mean, you can grab a free excerpt at humblealphabook.com, read a little bit of it. I know you're going to love it. Then get the book or get it on audible or get it on Kindle. And I'm not saying that because we make money. You don't make money on books, by the way, for anyone who's wondering, unless you're a New York times bestseller, um, you, you make very little. So it isn't about that. It's about the impact that we want to have in this. We want to have this book. I promise you, if you read this book, that's my little bit of radiant value to you and your listeners. And they will learn then or will realize how they can add radiant value in the world to make this actually make it a better place. Everyone talks about global warming and fixing that big problem and this big problem. Unless you have direct impact on that problem, you're not going to change anything. Hmm. You have to change your life enterprise first. You have to have direct impact with the people around you to change their lives. And then that ripple effect, that radiant value then carries out. That's the only way you can change anything. And so, so when, when we talk about life enterprise, we always say you're the CEO of your own life enterprise, just like a CEO of a business enterprise. And our job is to keep the business or our life healthy and profitable, right? So what, how does the CEO do that? He answers or she answers to the board of directors, which is your family and mm -hmm. the stakeholders or shareholders, which is everyone in your life. And how do you do that? You leave them in a better place when, than when you met them. You invest in them as, in like you invest in the relational capital. You make sure they're in a good place. You support them. You solve their problems. You help them out. And when you live like that, like you would at work, I think every CEO would, would, would agree with me. Yeah, I got to do that at work. Well, why the heck aren't you doing that at home? The same person at home as the same person at work. It's called integration, not balance. Hmm. Right? You integrate your identity and your purpose into your business and your personal life. And you're golden. And I mean, you are golden. Wow. Yeah. Huge. Love it. So we will certainly link to the book in the show notes. Where else can we go to connect with you and be able to consume more of your content and your videos? Right. My, my videos are on Stephen Kuhn Official on Facebook, Stephen Kuhn Official. And it's just posted every day on my private account. I'm, I'm always maxed out of friends, unfortunately. So just follow me on my page or whatever, and we can, we can hook up. You can write me on my page as well. Um, and in Clubhouse, I'm, I'm in um, Breakfast with Champions every, every Monday to Friday um, from 5, 5 Eastern to 11 Eastern, <laughs> which is easy for me because it's, it's 11 to 5 here, so it's easy. Um, and uh, I'm not always in the room, obviously. But yeah, you can, you can grab me there or just grab me. You can look me up. Stephen Cohn, you'll find me anywhere. Not the jazz Perfect. pianist, by the way. Just <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we'll make sure that we have the right one in the show notes. So everyone, all of you that are listening or watching right now can make sure that you connect with Steven. Take a look at his, his content. Get into his world. Look into the way that he thinks and processes information and also buy a copy of the book. So Steven, quickly, here is my final question to you. What's been the most pivotal learning experience in your professional career to date? In my professional career, I think it would have to be when I, when I was, when I had a guest ask me if I wanted to help him take his, his um, South African health club chain to Germany. I was in, I was in Berlin and I, I was like, you're, you're looking at the bartender here. Why are you asking me that question kind of thing? I'm thinking to myself and I did it and I crushed it. Right. And then I had the PLC from the UK headhunt me. And they, they made me the director and they literally quadrupled my pay, quadrupled my, 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 my pay. And I was sitting there with the CEO after I got hired and I said, look, man, I got to tell you something. Like, I don't even know how to, I don't even know what a PNL is. You told me to read the PNL. I don't even know what that is. Like what, what? And he said, shut up and do it. Mm. <laughs> that was my lesson, man. Wow. <laughs> shut up and do it. And do it. He said, all you right. can whine all day or you can just get out there and do it. So shut up and do it. And that's what he said. And this, 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 is, this is a listed company in, on, on the British stock market, in the London stock market, the Amazing. CEO telling me to do that. Amazing. And you know what? You know what happened? I freaking did it. You did it. I, did it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. perfect. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank, I appreciate you sharing that. And thank you so much for spending some time with us on Business Minds Coffee Chat. I, I truly am grateful. And I, I'm glad that, that we entered the same space on Clubhouse and that we can continue to build this relationship beyond that platform. And I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and experience with all of us today. My absolute pleasure, Jay. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. It's always, it's always a, a good opportunity to share and, and create some radiant value. 
There you go. Love that. And for all of you, thank you so very much for watching and listening. And please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Let us know what you thought of this episode. Maybe share one or two key takeaways. I know both of us would greatly appreciate that. And to enjoy more episodes and to learn how J. Shear Business Consulting can help build a solid foundation for your service-based business, just visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com. And until next time, keep learning and growing. Order your copy of Unleash Your Humble Alpha, and we'll see you on the next Business Minds Coffee Chat. Take care. Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear Business Consulting. 